um, Professor Whipple, Professor Chauve, ladies and gentlemen, all of us fellow students. It's a very great honor to be here with an awesome list of predecessors. <laughs> it's also a very great joy to be here among so many people who for me have been heroes and heroines over a long period and whose friendship I have long valued. I also appreciate such a turnout on one of these gorgeous late fall days, which I think only Virginia can lay on. It's truly an act of ascetic renunciation <laughs> to have come underground with such glory around you. Um, this lecture, I'd like to begin in the first century AD with the well-known saying of Jesus of Nazareth to the rich young man. Matthew 19, 16, 22. Jesus said unto him, If you will be perfect, go, sell all that thou hast, give to the poor, and then thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. It will end on a more prosaic note, with the birth of a professional clergy in the course of the third century AD. The two themes may seem widely different, one from the other, but it was between these two themes that Christian thought on religious giving swung like a great pendulum from the days of the first missionary journeys of St. Paul to the age of Constantine and beyond. A complete study of the use of wealth in the Christian churches in its first three centuries has to take account of both themes. So uh, let us begin with the crucial challenge of Jesus to the rich young man, for it held a particular charge of meaning for late antique Christians as a whole. If thou wilt be perfect, go, sell all that thou hast, and give to the poor, and then thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Jesus was believed to have said the same to his disciples. Sell your possessions and give alms. Provide yourselves with purses that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no rob moth destroys. Luke 12, 33. Similar notions concerning treasure in heaven circulated also in Jewish circles. In the Jerusalem Talmud of the 4th century, King Monobazos, the Jewish king of Adiabene on the Euphrates, was said to have spent his fortune on providing food for the poor in Jerusalem. His infuriated kinsfolk accused him of living down to his name, which was derived from the word bazaz, to plunder. Monobazos was plundering the earthly inheritance of his family. He answered them at great length. My fathers, he said, laid up treasure for below, but I have laid up treasure for above. They laid up treasures in a place over which the hand of man may prevail, I in a place over which no hand can prevail. My fathers laid up treasures useful in this world, I for the world to come. At the same time, pagans of the second and third centuries reacted to the idea of treasure in heaven with studied incredulity. At the end of the third century, the great pagan philosopher Porphyry opined that this saying of Jesus could not have come from Christ itself. It was too coarse. 
It must have been invented by poor people with the intention of shaming the rich into giving all the money to them. Ectoiautes kenophonias, by such airhead talk. Porphyry Roche, that he had known well-to-do ladies who had impoverished themselves, made themselves a burden to their family through having taken these passages too, too seriously. Late antique pagans might be suspicious of the notion of treasure in heaven. We are simply embarrassed. When one turns to the current scholarship on this theme, we find that the idea of treasure in heaven has come to be surrounded by a loud silence. Neither the Catholic Dictionnaire de la Spiritualité nor the Protestant Theologische Real Encyclopédie is there an entry on trésor or on schatz. Nor can such an entry be found in the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church or in the recent Oxford Companion to, um, Ju to um, Judaism. The few studies that have been addressed to the theme of treasure in heaven approach it with ill-disguised discomfort. One such study by Klaus Koch insists that Jesus must have meant something different from the meanings that had come to be attached to his words in later centuries. Belief in the direct accumulation of treasure in heaven through almsgiving on earth was dismissed out of hand by Koch. It was für den Protestanten eine abscheuliche Vorstellung, a notion abhorrent to any Protestant. It somehow seems worse in German. <laughs> uh, modern Jewish scholars are no less embarrassed. Faced by the tale of King Monobaz, the great Talmudic study, scholar Ephraim Urbach confessed it was difficult for him to see in King Monobaz's prolonged and monotonous explanation traces of any refined doctrine or any sublimation of the materialistic simile of collecting treasures above through squandering them below. Why is it that a way of speaking of the relation between heaven and earth, which late antique and medieval Christians took for granted, why does it seem so very alien to us? Why is it that we have such inhibitions in approaching the subject of the joining of God and gold? Now, in order to understand this inhibition, I would suggest that we turn for a moment to the anthropologists. Anthropologists have pointed out that our particular notion of exchange is the product of the commercial revolution of modern times. This commercial revolution has, as it were, placed an imaginative glass wall between ourselves and giving practices that were once taken for granted in Jewish and Christian circles. As the anthropologist John Parry has pointed out, as economic transactions become increasingly differentiated from other types of social relationship, he says, the transactions appropriate to each become ever more polarized in terms of their symbolism and ideology. And he goes on to say, Western ideology has emphasized the distinctiveness of the two cycles religious relations with heaven, commercial transactions on earth, that it is then unable to imagine the mechanisms by which they are joined. Nowadays, to be frank, the thought of joining of heaven and earth through money strikes as something more than a harmless exercise in the imagination. It has the quality of an off-color joke. But if we're to understand the imaginative energy that drove religious giving in Christian and to a large extent also in Jewish and later in Muslim circles, 
in the late antique and early medieval periods, we have to recapture something of the weight and the distinctive profile of the notion of a transfer of wealth from earth to heaven, implied in the words of Jesus and of King Monobaz. Let me try to do this inevitably very briefly in the first part of this lecture. First, to begin with, we must of course defamiliarize the sayings of Jesus. As modern persons, we tend to think that we know what he meant. We assume that the notion of placing treasure in heaven was no more than a stirring metaphor. It was chosen by Jesus so as to instill in his followers heroic indifference to wealth and to encourage them to redistribute that wealth for the betterment of the needy. But these are modern reactions. In late antiquity, a considerably wider conglomerate of notions gathered around the story of Jesus and the rich young man. Among these notions, the redistribution of wealth through giving to the poor was undeniably present, but it was not necessarily the only notion, nor was it the most important. What struck late Roman hearers most forcibly was something rather different. In this one saying, Jesus had brought together two starkly opposed incommensurables and had declared that the one might be transformed into the other through an exchange which flouted all the rules of social common sense. Heaven and earth, rich and poor, each thought to be immeasurably different, the one from the other, were brought together in the act of giving. It's this emphasis on the counterfactual joining of incommensurables, which I think challenges the historian of the social imagination in late antiquity. For the incommensurables ramified. Not only did wealth with its sinister overtones of gross and heavy matter touched by evil, by transience, and by death, join the unbearable lightness of a world beyond the stars by becoming treasure in heaven. The primal joining of heaven and earth was mirrored within society itself. The starkly antithetical poles of rich and poor were thought to be brought together through almsgiving. But rich and poor are not the only pair of antithetical social groups. The antithetical lifestyles were also thought to face each other across a social chasm. Those who few who enjoyed leisure were thought to live a life that was as distant from the lives of the vast majority of persons who had to work for a living as heaven was different from earth, as rich from poor. <laughs>